If you weren't somewhat taken aback by Christ's words today in the gospel, maybe you weren't paying attention. Do you think that I have come to establish peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, a father will be divided against son, mother against her daughter, and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. Although the last one I don't really think Jesus should try to take too much credit for. I mean, (laughs) sorry, Lord, but like mother-in-law and daughter-in-law were divided far before you came here. So, but I think it begs the question, who do you most love in life? It's a very important question because the one that we most love in this world is the one that we obey. I come from a very Italian family, at least by tradition, and it was always said when we were growing up, there's nothing more important than family. And so my hierarchy of values really had to be turned upside down when God called me to be a priest because so many of my family members at that time didn't understand and didn't want me to do it. But it's the first time I was confronted with that question. Who do I most love on this earth? Was I going to please the people that I most love in this world? Or was I going to please God? Because we act according to who we most love. In life, the choices we make, the beliefs we hold, will always be based on that one principal factor. Who I most love on this earth. That's one of the essential dramas of life. And that's why even in Scripture you'll see often that the sins of the Father, it says, pass down to the Son. Why is that? Why do the sins of the Father always go down to the sins of the Son? It's because the love between the Father and the Son is so strong that even if it's a bad example, the natural proclivity is that the Son will imitate the Father's example. Right? That was like the great drama in the movie, well, really the book, The Godfather, right? At the beginning of it, Michael Corleone doesn't want anything to do with the mafia or crime or anything like that, but it's through love of his father, when his father's attacked, that he gets drawn into a life of crime until he becomes the head mob boss. But it was because of his love. So that's the reason the question, who do you most love in life, is so important because the choices we make will be based upon that answer. We obey who we love. And that's why the entire, the entire commandments of God is based upon that first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and have no other God before Him. To love God above all others is to choose to please Him, to do His will, to follow Him before any other person on this earth. And I think that's one of the hardest things we, get to, we have to face on a day-to-day basis, especially for a priest. It's no easy task. One of the priests I most admire in my life, one bit of advice he gave me that I've never forgotten. He said, the most difficult thing for me and my priesthood has been for these 50 years, having to disappoint the people I most loved on this earth in order to be faithful to God. I've come to agree with that even in my short time. Because every priest wants to be loved by his parishioners, right? Especially if they're from all saints. You want to have a close bond. And like my I think my, that's my greatest temptation because I'm a people person. I love people. They don't always like me, but I love people. But there's the, there's the great temptation for a priest, if he loves people more than he loves God, will he ever say anything that offends people? Will he speak the difficult truths that will jeopardize the love that he wants from his people? Answer is no. That's why a priest must love God first and foremost above everything else to properly guide and direct his people to heaven. That's why St. Paul says, if I wanted to please people, I would not be a slave of Christ. We are slaves to the one we most love on this earth. That's why God must be first. That's why Christ says, do you think I've come to establish peace on earth? No, I tell you, 
but rather division. That was the first prophecy about Christ after his birth when he was taken to Simeon in his circumcision. Simeon said he is destined to be a sign that will be contradicted, a sign of division from the very beginning. And why is he a sign of division? Because the truth in itself is divisive. And Christ came to this earth to teach us the truth, how to live on this earth. And there's two basic camps in this world, just two. Those who adhere to the truth of Jesus Christ and those who reject them. That's it. And that dividing line cuts so close to our own hearts that it even comes to the very nucleus of our life, which is our family. And that's why Christ says, I have come to divide father and son, mother and daughter, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. Why family? Why does he take it to family? Because those are the ones we most naturally love the most on this earth. Therefore, it's, it's through our love for our family that we can be most tempted to reject the truths of Christ. Because we act according to those whom we most love on this earth. And that's a fact. And I've really come to see the most dangerous people for my vocation as a priest is not my people who would say they're my enemies, people who I don't like or don't like me. Because I never jeopardize what I do for people I don't like. It's the people I love, the people I really care about. It's them that I'm constantly tempted to conform my, to some way compromise my faith because I want to be loved by the people that I love. So we all fear rejection, but that's the price of the gospel. That's why Christ takes it down to our very family. If you love anybody more than me, when push comes to shove, you're going to change what you believe. You're going to change the way you act in order to please them over me. And that's why we see in the prophet Jeremiah, he's being lowered down into a cistern. He's rejected by the people because why? He was speaking a truth that the people didn't want to hear. And who was he speaking, speaking to? Was it pagans? Foreigners? No, he was talking to his own people. He was talking to the Israelites. And they said, because you're not preaching in a way that is good for the people, we reject you. That's why the majority of the prophets in the Old Testament were put to death. Because they were speaking a truth that the people didn't want to hear. And they could never do that if they didn't have their hearts set on God first. They ended up dead because, well, the truth sets you apart. And to be set apart is to be in danger. To be different is to become a target. Now, I learned the most interesting thing about zebras the other day. Why do zebras look the way that they do? Every animal adapts itself so it can survive in its environments, right? When you think about the Sahara African desert, everything is gold, green, and brown. A zebra's black and white. Like, you can see it a mile away. It's a really bad situation when the predator, like a lion, blends right into the ground. You can't see it even if you're looking. And a zebra is the prey. You can see it anywhere from a mile away. Well, the trick is they're blending into themselves. That's why they're always in a herd, because they're always moving back and forth. Because a, a lion, it can't attack just one zebra. I mean, it can't attack a herd. It needs to go after one. But because they all look the same, and they're always going back and forth, it can never set its eyes just on one. You know, so scientists had this problem when they were trying to watch how zebras acted. They'd try to look at one, and they'd keep losing it. So they'd go up, and they'd mark it with a red paint, some, some kind of a dot or something. Well, what do you think happened to that zebra? The next time a lion came along, it was always the first one to be killed because now the lion had something to look at. So zebras survive by blending into the herd. Well, so do human beings. 
We're social animals, so we blend in to survive. We go along so that we don't have to stand out. And we're constantly tempted to sacrifice our beliefs and to act according to the ways of everyone else so that we don't become a target. And what does the truth of Christ do when we're living according to it? It paints a big red cross right over us so that we cannot hide. That's what I hear from families all the time with four, five, six, seven children. They go out in public, they got a huge cross on them. People look at them, haven't you ever heard of contraceptives or you know, birth control? It's a cross they have to carry all the time. What about when you're in a restaurant? How hard is it to pray in a restaurant? It's difficult because you don't want to draw a lot of attention to ourselves. But when we live according to the truth of Christ, it sets us apart. And who wants to be set apart? You become food for the lions. That's the fear. If I'm different from everyone else, something bad's going to happen to me. It's fear that keeps us running along with the majority of people. And that's why only love can conquer that. You have to choose which camp you're going to belong to. Are you going to choose to belong to the world or to the witnesses of Christ? Hebrews said, you are surrounded continually by a cloud of witnesses. What are they talking about? The saints. And witness, martyrdom in, in Greek, martyrs. You're constantly surrounded by the saints who went before you, who allowed themselves to be crossed with the blood of Christ, set apart, and sacrificed their life for his gospel. And we have to choose which camp we're going to go with daily and even in our own families. Right? Christ said to us, the last thing that he said to his disciples is, if you belong to the world, the world would love its own. But I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. It's okay for us to be hated by the world because we're different. In fact, if we are not feeling some persecution from the world because our beliefs make us different, well, then we have to ask the question, have we so assimilated the ways of the world that we're no different from them? When was the last time someone called you out for your faith and said, you don't live the way that everyone else lives? There's something different about you. That's the litmus, litmus test for where we're at. Do we stand out as different? Or are walking in ways according to the ways of the world? But that's why Christ said, there is a baptism with which I must be baptized and how I yearn for it to be accomplished. What was the baptism he was talking about? It wasn't as he'd already been baptized by John. It was the baptism of the cross. Jesus came to go to the cross. He did not come to make peace on earth. He came to bring war. War against sin. War against the evil one. War against the fallen ways of the world. Not a material war like the Crusades or something like that, but a spiritual war. And we ourselves have to ask, am I trying to make peace in my family? Am I trying to make peace in my situation wherever I'm at? To go along, to get along? Because you're going to have to sacrifice a lot of values in, in order to do that. Or am I living according to the gospel of Christ? Which will bring me to the cross? Which will make me a sign of contradiction? Which will cause division? And we're made for love. So we can't just do that for the sake of truth. It's not about truth or love. It's about falling so deep in love with Jesus Christ that I'm willing to sacrifice everything for His truth because of His love. And that's why Christ went to the cross. He makes a complete gift of Himself, body, blood, soul, and divinity on that cross and in the Eucharist a complete gift of Himself so as to inspire the same love within us. So that looking at Him and receiving Him, I too might be inspired to make a complete gift of myself 
back to him. Who do you love most in this life? It's the most important question we can ask ourselves because it determines everything we become for now and for all eternity.